An article on the BBC's website about the buzzword sustainability asks, could grasshoppers really replace beef? For most people in Europe and the West, the notion of eating crickets and grasshoppers is rather revolting. But the BBC article seeks to convince us that insects are a popular snack in parts of Africa and Asia, packed with nutrition. But most of all, they say eating insects would be less harmful to the climate. Did you know, according to the Bible, that claiming it's wrong to eat certain foods is a doctrine of demons for the last days? The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Hello, I'm Christine Dark. Apocalyptic headlines are abounding. Powerful earthquakes in Turkey have killed thousands. They were felt as far away as Israel, and the aftershocks were described like Armageddon. Jesus warned that earthquakes would be part of the birth pains of the end times. The Lord also prophesied famines. Across Africa, from east to west, people are experiencing a food crisis bigger and more complex than the continent has ever seen. That's according to diplomats and humanitarian workers. Meanwhile, a severe shortage of wheat is forcing many Pakistanis to wait in line for hours to receive a single bag of flour. Egg prices in the USA have already shot up to a level that most people never dreamed would be possible. Food, as we'll see in this Bible prophecy update, will become increasingly controversial and expensive. A century ago, and especially during the Holocaust, the rebirth of the nation of Israel seemed impossible, but current events have a way of catching up with Bible prophecy, and Israel is an established fact which has caused honest eschatologists to have to readjust their Bible prophecy charts. Now all sorts of current events are catching up with prophecies made long ago in the Bible. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and get this, doctrines of devils. These people are hypocrites and liars, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The Amplify says their consciences are cauterized, forbidding people to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, foods, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For Paul said, every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with what? with thanksgiving, for it, the food, is sanctified, it's hallowed by the word of God and prayer. Amen. Let's not forget to sanctify our food when we dine. So there you have it, the New Testament forewarned that in the last days, doctrines of demons will forbid the eating of certain foods. The world's elites who claim God is dead want the serfs to eat insects and to abstain from beef and so forth in order to protect the environment. But it's all really about government control of our lives. And if we're not careful, even within the churches, there are legalists who demand that we abstain from certain foods. You know that I greatly appreciate the Jewish people and the Jewish culture but the command to keep a Jewish diet is not required in the New Testament. Although admittedly it is healthy to abstain from certain foods, that I will admit. However, dietary legalism is absent from the New Testament. And nevertheless, as a doctrine, dietary legalism has made inroads into many churches, 
by insisting that believers in Jesus should eat in accordance with Jewish law. Some advocates even go so far as to say that those who do not comply with Jewish dietary laws can't be healed by the Lord and are even in jeopardy of losing their salvation. But that's a lie, plain and simple. According to the New Testament, it's a doctrine of demons, according to verses I've just read to you. Actually, to clear up this matter, all we have to do is study what took place at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. Church leaders convened to consider if Gentile believers in Jesus should be required to obey the law of Moses. Foremost, of course, was the question of circumcision, although dietary matters were also on the table. Well, the Jerusalem Council took place in about the year 50 AD, and the apostles decreed that the new Gentile believers who were coming to faith in Messiah did not have to observe the Mosaic law. Obedience was required to only a portion of Jewish law. Namely, the apostles stipulated four things, that we should abstain from food polluted by idols, abstain from sexual immorality, abstain from the meat of strangled animals, and from the consumption of blood. Now, concerning Paul's warning to his protege Timothy about the doctrines of demons in the last days, the apostle addressed the appalling apostasy that we're actually witnessing today. He wrote, The Spirit clearly tells us that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith. And tragically, we're watching it happen in real time. Evil is being called good and good evil. One American senator tweeted that he proudly wears an abortion pin in public. I can't vouch for the accuracy, but according to a recent article by Evangelical Focus, in the UK, only 6% of adults identify as practicing Christians. The research was conducted during online interviews with about 4,000 UK adults with some supplementary field work over the past year. Although only 6% said they practiced Christianity, 42% of the UK adults said they identified as non-practicing Christians. But Paul was careful to warn of this apostasy, and it's not surprising when we consider end-time prophecies by the prophet Daniel, for example, concerning the Antichrist in verses like, Daniel 7.25 and Daniel 8.23, and by Jesus himself, who spoke of many deceivers who would come after him. The mystery of iniquity had already begun to work, and Paul warned that the apostasy would develop to the point that some will depart from the historic faith. Some, not all, not the whole church, thankfully, but a considerable part of it. The true church will never be extinguished, but the apostasy we're seeing in the West is a shocking end-time thing. Although our society is rapidly becoming apostate, it's ironic that with every passing day, more evidence continues to emerge that validates the Bible. A team of researchers in France has determined that an ancient stone called a stele on display at the Louvre Museum in Paris actually contains references to King David from the Bible. The fragment of stele, also known as the Moabite stone, was discovered in 1868 in the region of Moab in Jordan, about 15 miles east of the Dead Sea. It's an upright slab bearing an inscription dating back to 840 B.C. Our son Daniel took us to see this stone in the Louvre a number of years ago when he was a student in Paris damage to the stone's face had made accurate translation of the text difficult in the past. But by using newer techniques in digital photography, researchers have verified that the text does refer to the biblical King David. Phrases include the House of David and Altar of David. The stone also bears the earliest known reference to the sacred name of God, the Hebrew Tetragrammaton, yud heh vav heh 
How wonderful and how timely. However, the prophesied apostasy that we've been witnessing is due to faith being corrupted by denial of truth and adding what is false. I think the Apostle Paul expressed the situation accurately by indicating that the real culprits are seducing spirits, unseen agents, fallen angels in the spirit world who manipulate people and minds behind the scenes. In fact, scriptures often speak of sacrifices being made to demons. Just when I think I've become shockproof, I was shocked yet again to read that an organization calling itself the Satanic Temple is opening a so-called health clinic in the American state of New Mexico to provide what they claim will be free religious medication abortion. Cynically, the Satanic Temple will name the facility after the mother of a U.S. Supreme Court justice in order to mock Justice Samuel Alito, who authored the majority opinion that overturned the court case, Roe v. Wade, concerning abortion on demand. The Satanic Temple is regarded in the USA legally as a religion and has insisted that its members have a religious right to receive abortions as part of a, quote, satanic abortion ritual, end quote. Once someone determines they want to undergo the abortion ritual, the satanic temple believes that the state has no right to intervene in what is essentially a religious practice. Well, with such practices being allowed under the guise of freedom of religion, It's really no surprise that Satan and his minions were applauded at the 65th Annual Grammy Awards held in Los Angeles, sponsored by CBS Television and by the pharmaceutical giant Pfizer. The performance featured strippers, devil horns, and a red cage during the hit song called Unholy. Many viewers called it demonic and a tribute to Satan. Although the shock effect and mockery of Christian values is certainly nothing new. The performing duo took home the award for Best Pop Duo or Group Performance. And the American president's wife, Jill Biden, made a surprise appearance at the end of the show. While the Apostle Paul's description of apostate leaders is certainly timely reading, he stated that they speak hypocritical lies with a dead conscience. And how relevant are his words? Consider the hypocrisy of leaders who demand of people the very things they themselves refuse to do. The hypocrites fly around in jets, living the most lavish lifestyle imaginable, yet insist that everybody else should drive electric cars or ride bicycles or limit their comings and goings to the radius of a 15-minute city. They insist that walkable and bikeable neighborhoods must become the norm, not the exception, and climate lockdowns are predicted for the future. So get used to going nowhere. Now, from our text today in 1 Timothy 4, we learn that spiritual entities called demons, fallen angels, masquerade under the guise of religion. They don't always appear in red suits and horns like the Grammy Awards show. Demons often entice people to engage in pious religious asceticism, like forbidding people to marry and forbidding them to eat certain foods. A person can receive the false impression that they're pleasing God when God has not commanded them to do these things. In fact, the gospel teaches us that we cannot earn favor with God. Our responsibility is to believe on him whom God has sent. Jesus made this clear in John 6, 28. People came to him and asked, what must we do to perform the works of God? Interesting that Jesus didn't say live a celibate life or eat kosher foods. Instead, he answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Yet, demons try to entrap people in mere religious formalism rather than people developing a real spiritual life. 
just going through all the motions of religion without any of God's power is, let's face it, a demonic doctrine. So in 1 Timothy 4, Paul said forbidding to marry is a doctrine of devils. A vow of celibacy in the church is actually contrary to the word of God, and people need to know this. Yes, occasionally celibacy is practiced by individuals who are clearly led by the Holy Spirit, but generally speaking, the Word of God promotes marriage as a healthy and normal lifestyle. Indeed, the Word of God extols marriage and makes no exception for the clergy or anyone else to undertake a celibate vow. In fact, Hebrews 13.4 states, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Furthermore, the scriptures attest to the fact that priests in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament, ministers are to be husbands of one wife. So says 1 Timothy 3.2. Paul made the case and testified that the apostles were married. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 9.5, Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us, as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do, and as Cephas, Peter, does? Don't forget that in Bible times, the prophets, priests, the Levites, and all those who attended the service of God at the altar were allowed to marry. Abraham was prophet and priest in his own house, and he was married to the matriarch Sarah. Rebekah was the wife of God's choosing for Isaac. God never blamed the great prophet Moses for marrying Zipporah, and Isaiah was a married man. Even in the New Testament, ministers have an expressed allowance to marry. So is it any wonder that the Roman Catholic Church, which demands celibacy of its clergy, is being torn apart by sexual controversies? The late Pope Benedict XVI has claimed in a posthumously published book that gay clubs operate openly in Catholic seminaries as the men prepare for the priesthood. In a blistering attack on the state of the Catholic Church under his successor's papacy, Benedict, who died at the age of 95, said that the vocational training of the next generation of priests is on the verge of collapse. Despairing of the progressive agenda of Pope Francis, Benedict also claimed that some bishops allow trainee priests to watch pornographic films as an outlet for their sexual urges. But most counselors know that marriage would prevent many of these tendencies. As for the forbidding of eating meats and other foods, Paul stated in 1 Timothy 4.4 4, that we are free to eat whatever we want if the food is received with thanksgiving. So the scriptures teach that giving thanks consecrates and sanctifies our food. Furthermore, in the book of Acts, Paul gave thanks for food in the midst of a terrible storm at sea. The incident demonstrates that even danger or haste should not prevent us from offering up thanks to God. We should always take time to do so. There are many reasons for saying grace over a meal. We thank God for his provision, for health, and we demonstrate and acknowledge our gratitude to God for nourishing us. A person who fails to give thanks reveals an unrenewed heart, or it certainly demonstrates ingratitude. Saying grace in public also sets a good example, honors the Lord, promotes gratitude and morality. Now then, to summarize what we've said so far, in our day we're watching a departure from the historic faith Rather than embracing the faith that has been once and for all delivered to the saints, the new demonic influences entice people to depart from historic doctrine concerning marriage, for example. And think about this. The institution of marriage between a man and a woman has always been accepted throughout all of history, but only now in the later times is the institution of marriage being questioned. This is what Paul warned Timothy about when he said people would depart from the faith. This would include the denial of the basic truths of the Christian faith. 
Another false doctrine that demons promote is the denial that Messiah has come in the flesh. 1 John 4 in verses 2 and 3 tells us, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. Demonic spirits also despise and even curse Christ. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I want to draw your attention to an article this week by Michael Snyder, headline, The Collapse of Faith in America. Michael wrote that once upon a time, the United States was known as a Christian nation. But now the country is moving away from its Judeo-Christian roots at a pace that is absolutely breathtaking. In 1972, a survey found that 92% of all Americans identified as Christians. But the most recent Pew survey discovered that only 63% of Americans still identify in some way as Christians, and yet many who claim to be Christians nevertheless reject many traditional Christian values. Protestant pastors report that typical church attendance is down from pre-pandemic levels. And a recent article in the Guardian newspaper in Britain claimed that thousands of churches are closing each year in the USA. So we're going down the exact same road that almost every other Western nation has already traveled. At one time, virtually every nation in the Western world was considered Christian but now most have been transformed into what has been called post-Christian societies. It could be argued that the United States is already there. And one recent survey found that most parents do not consider it important to pass their faith on to their children. Imagine that. Parents are placing less importance on their children growing up to have religious or political beliefs that are similar to their own. And that is just dangerous. During a recent interview, Franklin Graham, the son of the late evangelist Billy Graham, told CBN's Faithwire that he's read the book of Revelation and God is going to judge this earth for the rejection of his son and there's going to be a great price to pay. Is anybody listening to the warnings? Yet at the same time, how amazing that in the Islamic world, people are receiving a saving knowledge of Messiah through the divine agencies of dreams and visions. We published this book, The Jesus Visions, A Miracle Among Muslims, in 2007 after many earlier editions, and soon it's going to become an e-book. As Jesus has done throughout the past 2,000 years, he is still showing people that he is alive. All over the Middle East, vast numbers of Muslims are still becoming Christians after supernatural experiences with Jesus. The founder of an organization preaching the gospel and planting churches in Iran recently told CBN's Faithwire that many Iranians are enraptured by Jesus due to visions. They can't stop talking about it, hence the severe persecution they're suffering. And despite the severity of the brutality of the persecution many brave Iranian Christians face, believers are saying, I saw a vision of a man in a white robe with a cross on his shoulder or on his heart. And he revealed to me, I am Jesus. Follow me. And similar words like that. Hallelujah. Well, the trends in the West are following the forecast of Bible prophecy. And I want to encourage you to hold on. Jesus is coming soon. That's our blessed hope. I feel led to ask today, are you perhaps experiencing a time of anxiety and sorrow? If so, Jesus is definitely your man. He wants to be your companion. Isaiah 53, 3 prophesied that he would be a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. That's why he can identify with our pain 
and help to alleviate it. Sometimes God allows our friends and loved ones to fail us so that we can learn to lean on the Lord. And by turning to Him, we receive spiritual growth, healing, deliverance, and hope. We're all going through difficult circumstances in these perilous times. And I receive prayer requests dealing with desperate situations. Just know that our Lord is a God of circumstances and he wants to show himself strong to you as you put your faith and trust in him. I like this word from the popular devotional streams in the desert. The Lord says, today I place a cup of holy oil in your hands. Use it freely, my child. Anoint every new circumstance and every word that hurts you, every interruption that makes you impatient and every weakness. The pain will leave as you learn to see me in all circumstances because whatever concerns you concerns me. I want you to learn that when the enemy comes in like a flood, your safety lies in letting me fight your battles. Amen. Also, I want to add this. If you're going through a struggle, and so many people are, if you're feeling oppressed, lonely, heavy-hearted, it's vitally important to take time to praise God in the midst of our struggles. Having the presence of mind to offer up praise and thanks to God is so important, just like offering up thanks for our food. It's a powerful weapon of spiritual warfare. Indeed, Psalm 22.3 says, The Lord is enthroned on the praises of His people. So let's often express our faith and why not proclaim with me this amazing verse, one of my favorites, Isaiah 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. That literally means in Hebrew, God is my Yeshua, my Jesus. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, Yehovah, is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation, my Yeshua, my Jesus. Amen. The Lord will be returning soon to take up residence as King of Kings on David's throne in Jerusalem. So I hope you can see how important it is to be a prayed up watchman on the walls of Jerusalem at this strategic time. To stay informed, I want to draw your attention to our website, exploits.tv, which continually reports on Bible prophecy, end time events, our prayer tours in the Holy Land, and at our website, we invite you to sign up for our electronic exploits news. Also, we have uploaded a library of videos available 24-7 at our Jerusalem Channel app, as well as our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site. In the meantime, Daniel 11.32b declares, The people who know their God will be strong, not weak, and we're going to do exploits, meaning we'll accomplish the works of the Lord before his imminent return. Have any questions? Contact me on the social media. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all until next time. I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom. I'm Christine Dart. Maranatha. It's great to be able to keep in touch in this digital world. And when you download our free Jerusalem Channel app to your mobile phone or tablet, you'll be the first to see all our new video teachings. You can also explore our bookshop and read the Bible. And you can help to support the channel through our donation page. So look for Jerusalem Channel in the Apple or Google Store and start to share in the good news of the gospel.